Hey guys, welcome back. This is Tuesday's video number two. So I'm just going to jump in right where we left off from the first video um, that you watched. Make sure obviously you don't get them out of order. Go ahead and watch the first video for today with the qualitative research paper introduction. And that is where we are starting here. So in the findings section of the qualitative research paper, and this is the template that again I downloaded um, and is available on eCampus for you guys to download here. In this template, for the finding section, you really just put kind of the raw data. So the raw data would be what you've coded from your survey. So none of the secondary source information goes here. It's all primary source information, which is why I've been so um, kind of strict on your proposals. Um, to make sure that you have enough information to ask your peers in order to have a full findings and discussion section. So in the findings section, it should just be either charts, graphs, uh, maybe some bullet pointed information. If you just have like a yes or no question, you don't need to, or you should not create a visual representation of yes or no questions because that would be kind of defeat the purpose of a visual representation of the data. However, for other parts, for other questions like multiple choice questions, some short answer on your survey, you could create into charts and, um, and or graphs, tables, etc. And I'm going to show you in another video how to start creating those findings for next week. All right, so that's for the finding section. The discussion section is really where you analyze the finding section. So the finding section is basically where if a researcher is using your work in his or her research or paper, they can go here, look at your statistical evidence or look at your charts, read them, and then if they don't want to know about an analysis or how you're making a bigger point about the research, then they can leave the finding section, leave the paper with just having looked at that chart. However, the discussion section is really where you get into the nitty gritty of your findings. So in this, you should um, write the discussion in terms of paragraphs that correlate one to one. For example, if you have finding no number one here, discussion number one should go first. Finding number two, discussion two. All right, you don't need to label them discussion two, like you need to label them finding one. And I'll show you a sample of that in a second in case you're confused. But the discussion section is really where you analyze. So at all moments, you should be asking yourself, why does this mass matter? What's the so what question, that infamous question you've probably heard before, the so what? Why does this information matter? So you get to the point where you have discussed all of your four to five findings. So you should have four to five paragraphs. And then you get to the um, last paragraph, which is still, it's about right here. This is kind of like a conclusion paragraph where you should say, overall, the data points to what? The data indicates what? So this is where you answer your research question. Because again, as, as I've mentioned, you should not um, have it all figured out. So in your proposal, you should not have a clear, I'm going to argue this. You should say, um, I want to investigate something. I want to inspect it. So that when you arrive at this part in your paper, you have investigated it. You have inspected it. Therefore, you can say confidently what your response is to your research question. That will essentially function as a thesis statement. In this future work section, it says it's optional here. I would highly recommend that you do add a little bit. Um, not only for length sake, but also for clarification. This is kind of like the limitation section of scientific, more scientific documents. So this is just what would you change if you could do the study again? What's important to investigate further? How are other scholars going to continue this work? And I would say about one to two paragraphs here. Then you get to the very bottom, which is your work cited. Um, you will use four out of the five of your sources and you can use different sources all right so you'll use them you'll cite them in MLA 8th edition even though this is 7th it's from when the 7th edition was the recent most recent one and again research goes in your introduction section here where you can write um, like I said a couple of paragraphs about how you came to arrive at your topic what's the um, impetus for your topic why is it important and then you can include some of the research here. 
So in order to solidify some of the things that I'm saying, let's look at a sample. This is the first sample that I offer you online. This is from fall of this past year, a student in um, English 102. So he looked at a week until the apocalypse. I took out his name, obviously, and then um, he left it correctly as we have it here, and he left the keywords correctly. Introduction, uh, this should all be double spaced, which will definitely help you guys with length. This is six pages single space, so it would be roughly 12 pages double space. So he is, he would be um, well within the margins of what I'm asking for in terms of page length. So the introduction, um, this is good information, but I would ask the student, or I did ask the student to include more research, and that will help provide a better basis for um, his information or the, the, purpose of the project. He provided some stuff here, which is an excellent way. Michael Hanlon from Daily Mail writes about blah, blah, blah. Then you go into the method section. He has very clear information about who his participants are. And again, they're separated accordingly. So procedures does not mix with participants. He doesn't mention the participants necessarily in the data analysis section, etc. One of the reasons why I chose this as a sample paper is because his findings are um, kind of a perfect representation of findings. So he has five of them. What is an apocalyptic event? This is pulled straight. This is the survey question that he wrote for the students. And he has the numbers here. These I would highlight and I would just make white so you can see them a little bit better. Um, and then this here I would just enlarge. So there's some formatting things that I would recommend to the student. However, the overall formatting of like figure one, and you can put just finding one here to make it easier for you to keep track of. You put finding two, and it looks like he did this one at the top, or when I changed the formatting, it actually messed it up a little bit. And then at the bottom, just be consistent. Put them at the top or at the bottom. So you could have figure two or finding two, that's fine. And again, he didn't have the question here, but he had kind of an overall or overarching topic and just enough information for you to understand what's the point of the visual representation. So this one here didn't need a visual representation. There were not a lot of categories like there are here. So he just said 14% of participants in the survey said they had they have prepared for an apocalyptic event. This is a yes or no question, and this is how you represent it. You just bullet point it and you put the information. Because otherwise, you're just going to have a visual representation of like, this is the yes section and this is the no section. And that doesn't really serve a greater purpose to take up this much space in a paper. So that kind of challenges you guys to have better survey questions, which we'll talk about just a second in this video. All right, this is again yes or no question. You can look at that and then he changed it up a little bit, but sticking to the same kind of color scheme and um, text. How would you spend your remaining time if an apocalypse were coming? So all of this doesn't need to be capitalized, spend remaining time apocalypse coming. And then he had this here. One thing you would want to do is you would want to put the first, the, the um, largest number first. So family would go first with 10 and then you would um, cascade it down. So we'll talk about that in later videos, how to make visual representations and how to make them as pleasing as possible. For the discussion section, um, he did a pretty good job of including the discussion paragraphs one to one. So he first talked about the first finding and then he merged into the second. He did also include research. Here's one example of Sean McIntosh. He is kind of a foremost zombie scholar, and I think some of you may have even mentioned him in your research, but um, he included, of course, the correct in-text citation. He included research here. This paper really did a, a great job with how to include research in the body of the discussion section. And then he did a future work section. Um, I would say expand on this a little bit more. And uh, this was the con consensus paragraph I was just talking about, the conclusion. Okay. Then he cited everything correctly. It looks really good. All right. So that's how you do the template. I'm going to go ahead and put this online, but 
I don't expect you guys to go through it necessarily. If you are confused, and again, this is the lame um, PowerPoint I just mentioned about using The Walking Dead, um, I try to pull out the most important parts, okay? So if you are having trouble understanding a specific part of the template and, and the book doesn't help and also my explanation of the template just now didn't help, you can always email me, but this I would recommend you go to as well. And I tried to kind of break it down a little bit better in terms of the things that you should provide, especially discussion. Students don't do a very good job typically in analyzing their findings. They just say what they found, which um, is again, just summarizing. So you need to go past just summarizing the data into analyzing it. What does this data mean? Why is it important? Why are you including it, et cetera? Okay, so put that online, um, probably in this section here. Now let's move on to survey questions. Part of your homework for today, which is the discussion post due at 6 p.m. tonight, in addition to your midterm portfolio, which is due at 11.59 tonight, and I showed you how to submit your portfolio in the previous video. All right, survey questions. I provided this document, and it's one of the only um, extra readings that I'm requiring for this class, in addition to just pages from the book. So that means I want you to really pay attention to it and really actually do this reading, because nine times out of 10, students who have not produce um, good enough survey questions have not read this document or at least the the minimum amount of pages I'm asking for you guys to read in this document so <clears throat> writing good questions for your surveys it includes just asking one thing at a time these are called double barrel barrel questions if you ask too many questions in one it gets confusing I'm sure like on assignment sheets um, if you have a teacher who asks you for eight things in like question A and 10 things in question B, it's just overwhelming. That's the same thing for a survey. And I'm sorry that my discussion questions are probably not good examples of asking about one thing at a time. However, it's a little bit different case. So <coughs> a poor question, you can see the example here. You guys have already read this, hopefully. Um, revising the question one, just break it into two separate questions. Okay, that's one thing. And SurveyMonkey for the free version, you're only allowed 10 questions, which is good for you because that means you don't have to do more work than 10 questions, but also bad because it means um, you have to really work on the phrasing of those questions to make sure they're not only clear, but also they don't contain too many questions or even assumptions in one item. All right, avoiding leading questions. These are pretty uh, self-explanatory. It's kind of like when you're at the dinner table with your family and um, you don't have the same beliefs as them, eat political, religious, whatever, and um, they ask you a leading question like uh, they, they kind of assume that you believe the same way that they do or even friends. Um, so there are some examples here. Just make sure that there's no assumption in your leading question. Some things I like to use are WVU is a party school, isn't it? Or don't you agree that WVU is a party school? Those are two leading questions. Obviously, you're forcing your um, respondent into an answer of like yes or no without even making room for um, going against the assumption. Closed and open questions. So open questions are who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. And closed questions are those ones that can end with one answer. So yes or no questions. Um, <clears throat> like any kind of question that has a single answer. I would recommend that you do not use who, what, when, or why questions. At least maybe just use one or two of them because not only does it take more time to answer those questions, um, respondents often skip them or don't provide enough feedback in order to uh, warrant or in order to basically make the space the question takes up, make sure that that space is worth it on the actual questionnaire. So one thing you can do is to use closed questions. And those are again, yes or no's. They have a couple of examples here. Write clear questions. So I just stumbled up my words a lot just a second ago. Um, don't do that in your surveys. All right, write clear questions that don't have leading responses or don't yield leading responses. And that's pretty much it for the surveys. If you can avoid these four things, then that will really help with your information. Another thing I'll talk about in another video is demographic information. You need to ask about um, 
probably class, like sophomore, not like social class, but, or financial class, but sophomore, you can ask about gender to see if there are any patterns there. And um, if you want, you can have an ask a question about age. So we'll talk about those more in tomorrow's video. But for right now, I want you guys to start thinking about your own questions and um, write a couple for discussion six, or sorry, for discussion 10, which is due at 6 p.m. tonight. So other than that, let me know if you guys have any questions yourself, and I'll do my best to answer them.